Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome everyone who joined. Welcome to everyone in the panel. Uh, well, the the panel name is uh, Accelerating the FinTech Revolution, and uh, my name is Amandeep. I'm you can ask for uh the 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 theme of this uh, this panel is basically what has happened in fintech space with uh, with specifically the years year of coronavirus uh interesting things have happened i will just uh, say few pointers or few teasers which uh, will follow in everyone's talk uh so some some of the interesting things was like uh, for example paypal reporting in may last year that uh, the fastest growing segment with that it's 50 year old plus um cherry i think might cover that part that uh, you could buy now an insurance with the with a video call uh, not requiring a physical uh, inspection uh we we have never heard of these things before but it is it has been happening on a regulatory space there's a lot of uh, tiff going on between uh, especially in europe i can say uh, what is a what is an outsourcing uh, using a cloud provider is an outsourcing uh, yes it is uh, so how, how to go go through it how to use the best of the uh, tech part of fintech uh to have the adoption faster and to comply with everything going on and something around crypto space and defi i think mariane will be the first speaker also covering that um yeah this is more or less uh, where we are heading to and uh, without uh, taking more time myself speaking i will call upon mariane uh, mariane uh, the stage the virtual stage is yours and uh, yeah please introduce yourself and uh, let's have you let's to hear you sure good evening and good late night to some of you my name is marian moro and i'm the ceo and founder of night gear and i'm so pleased to present to you from silicon valley where half of this panel is from uh we're a new startup at night gear and you probably have never heard of us but we use both distributed ledger as well as ai in our tech stack and what we do is move currencies around the world euros to dollars to yen and instead of it taking 48 hours we do it in seconds and for those capital markets folks in the room which i think some of us are especially on the panel ninth gear offers an innovative engine powering fx trades with intraday lending and the benefits of payment versus payment pvp settlement my background is over 25 years in institutional finance and capital markets with two successful um fintech exits one to s&p and the other to bmp parba asset management and i've assembled a team of veterans with experience from the largest financial institutions to tackle this problem and why is it important it's because 6.6 trillion dollars per day changes hands in the FX market. And while the world has really changed in 2020, um the arcane area of capital markets of foreign exchange, it hasn't changed much since 1973. 1973 is like 50 years ago. And for many years I wondered why does it take so long to settle? Being out here in Silicon Valley for over a decade now that moves me into action i no longer think why but what do we do to really fix this problem so um most of us live in a world and work in a digital first environment and the back us back office of finance is not that way it's analog not digital and bottom line i can use my phone here where i'm timing how many seconds i'm talking here i can send 20 bucks to amandeep through Venmo or Revolut through this device and he's going to get it in seconds but it still takes 48 hours to do it on an institutional level. So I believe that COVID-19 as extraordinarily difficult and horrific as it has been is not only a catalyst for change but it's an accelerant and business as usual is no more. New technologies have to be at the forefront. And if you'd ask banks as we rolled into 2020 if their teams would be working from home, they would have said absolutely not. 
One of my clients was the only person working in a 60 story office building for a few weeks because his bank was just not ready for this global pandemic. And he had to make sure that the lights were on. It was him and the security guards. Nobody would have predicted a year like the one we experienced. So we see this clear unfolding of opportunities across the markets. I don't believe that the full extent of the pandemic has been priced into the credit markets. I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg with regard to distressed opportunities. So firms must innovate and really embrace this shift to modernize end-to-end processes because the world has changed and we're not going back. So there's this clear need for this modernization of markets and settlement delays and failed trades cause risk and it's expensive for market participants. It's now time to implement market structures that eliminate these delays and trade failures. And at the same time, it's possible to improve the transparency of the markets and improve investor confidence and demonstrate really fair and equitable treatment for all the market participants. So we've developed technology for that modernization. And we use distributed ledger technology along with a couple of other things so that we can trade in seconds, not days, and we eliminate the trading risk and failed trades. So the recent trouble in equities with trading halts would not be repeated in the world of same day settlement. So we believe that now is the time to invest invest in really just a substantial campaign to implement this execution of modern technologies. Real time gross settlement is possible. And I believe that settlement risk is just unnecessary. And while still quite nascent, it's apparent that when harnessed correctly, distributed ledger technology will eliminate the dodgy plumbing that still powers the back office of financial institutions, moving us from analog into digital. So let me end with the the remarks about DeFi as the internet has unleashed data and information. Blockchain is really a protocol for trust. And However, we're still in the early days and it's going to be some time before these digital native assets completely remove the middleman and our mainstream because they aren't really all that fungible to the point where we can use them easily, but it's going to happen. So we keep our eye on the 70 or so central bank projects and it's an incredible time and exciting time to be in fintech. That's that's incredible. Um, yeah, indeed, exciting times. Uh, well, a lot of complaints I do have on um, money movements, especially from Europe to US. Uh, we'll we'll get there, but I think I will. I'll keep some some of those questions uh, for later. Uh, let's let's have a let's have a next speaker, uh, John. John, you're the next. Yeah, please, John. Please introduce yourself and uh, let's let's yeah. hear from you. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, John Soberg. I'm a managing partner at uh, MSMAD Ventures. I do early stage investing into startups around the world in, in fintech primarily. Um, my fund is backed by one of the largest insurance companies in the world that's based in, uh, in Japan. But um, we focus on, on anything that could relate to insurance. And then uh, I've been doing early stage investing in fintech for almost 12 years now, about 120 investments around the world. Um, so it's an exciting time, as everybody's been saying, and I'm 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 looking forward to, to having a good. You're on mute. Oh, uh, John, John, are you going to discuss your topic as well? So uh, uh, we are expecting to hear from you, like what you have been doing with the, especially in the new bank space. What are your thoughts? Yep. So the, 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 I guess, so we've got a few investments in a, in a couple different things. Uh, just like I think people said at the beginning. In Europe also. Um, and we've looked at a couple in other places. I think we're just seeing there, there's a couple things that come up, go into that. One is um, I, just that the product is much better than the, than the existing product. So I think that's been the case before. Um, the trust is now, uh, now a lot f- further than it was before. And I think COVID has actually helped that quite a bit. I think people, you know, 
it's it's kind of funny because you know the it always used to be well you wouldn't move your money from your bank but then now most people are doing that and they're not so unhappy with it and in general they actually are quite happy with it so why do I need to go to the ATM when I can use my my phone for this uh, so we're seeing we're seeing that and that I think is a big deal um, and then just just patterns I think people are starting to think much more about how why do I need to go here to do this the way I used to, or, uh, you know, the settlement conversation is a good one, but you can kind of apply that to just about everything. Um, and we're seeing it in insurance. We're seeing it in neobanks. I think, like I said, the neobanks are kind of leading, although I've got a couple of insurance companies in the portfolio that have gone kind of crazy on the valuations this year too. So um, it's, I guess it's an, a pretty exciting time across the board. Uh, there was a time when we used to say about uh, banks uh, acquiring fintechs, so, like uh, the fintech valuations, especially the neo bank valuations, have gone through roof this year. Um, yeah, I don't it know, might like, be the opposite pretty soon, right? The the neo banks will buy the the balance sheets so that they have it. I don't know. We'll see. Well, it's already it's like, started with Lending Club and SoFi. Um, yep. Yep. Wow. Wow. Uh, I was refraining from making that statement, but yes, I was ready to hear that. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, uh, we, we'll come back with some more questions, especially I think around valuations. Um, Jagdeep, uh, next is you. Um, like you are in the payment space from beginning to the end. So please yeah. enlighten us. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know about lightning, but I've been in payments for about 20 years at this point. I started out of college with Visa, uh, working on mobile payments back in 1999. So I currently lead the strategic alliances function at NMI. NMI is a 20-year-old startup backed by Francisco Partners. We're a white-label omni-channel payment gateway that enables um, transformation in app and in platform. So we allow platforms to embed payments as a core feature of the platform and offer it to those that are you know, writing or reselling the product. I think fintech has been a booming field for years, right? So business research has said fintech landscape would grow to like 309 billion annual growth rate of 24% through 2022. And that was all before COVID hit. And then COVID has been like wreaking havoc on some industries, but it's been great for payment and e-commerce, especially um, at the expense of physical retail, but the e-commerce has been growing at amazing rates and NMI and others in this space like Stripe and Square have been on the sort of the beneficiary side of this. So like just, just for some numbers, right? In um, consumers spent about 861 billion with the US retailers in 2020. That was up 4% from last year in 2019. The online spending represented about 21.3% of total retail last year compared to 15% the year prior. So this acceleration of that has been brought forward by COVID and it's a change in consumer behavior. We're no longer, you know, looking at e-commerce as something that the millennials or, you know, the boomers were doing. It's sort of become the way we do business. And it's interesting to see someone like a Home Depot. I mean, last time I bought something from them, I bought it online. I went to the store near me, picked it up. I didn't wait for UPS to bring it in five days. And that was, you know, within 15 minutes, they said your item's ready for pickup in a pickup locker. So that transformation inspired me to go and like listen to their, you know, quarterly call. An interesting number I heard there was like their platform now just for, you know, the 43% of their sort of transactions were that going that way. And their e-commerce site has seen a hundred percent increase in, in just usage. So it's amazing to see how, like, you know, last year, end of 2019, only 7% of online retailers were offering a curbside pickup option. Right now, out of the top 500, 43% offer curbside pickups. So we're seeing this consumer behavior shift that's making retailers and transformation take place at a much faster rate had it not been for COVID. So in, in like 2020, one dollar out of every five was spent in online orders. So there's this acceleration taking place. And, that, and I don't think there's elasticity that we're going to go back to the old way of doing things. This is going to become the new normal. And then the other topic I wanted to just hit on was like open banking. That's another sort of fintech 
area that's not so much in U.S., but outside of U.S., open banking has been a huge shift, right? And it's it's a little different than neobanks. It's, it's the idea that every bank has a set of APIs and you can go on top of them and build apps. We saw that with BSD2. We saw that with UPI in India. And it's been a transformational user experience where banks are just deposit holding institutions on the back end. The user experience, the one who enrolls controls type of experience is all being delivered by a startup. So we see that in India with a Paytm, with a phone pay, and that's an amazing transformation to see, and especially serving the underbanked and the unbanked segments where a payment bank like Airtel is now getting into, which is a telco getting into the payment business. So I think the transformation in fintech has just been accelerated by COVID and it's just going to continue from here. I'll, I'll wait there for next round. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that, that, uh, the second part, open banking, is uh, particularly of interest as well. Like uh, a lot of uh, apps are getting uh, developed and getting mainstream. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, we'll come back with more questions. And next we have Sherry. Sherry coming from Singapore. Uh, what's you, happening in insurance space? Yes. Thank you. And um, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. I'm Sherry. I'm the founder and CEO of Planner B. Um, we're based in Singapore. We are an insurtech startup um, focused on Asia. Um, my experience is in financial planning, and it's been um, in the traditional uh, platform for more than 12 years. I started Planner B in 2019, and we had launched only in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so our our focus is to transform how financial planning is done. It's interesting how insurance had been invented sometime in the 1300s and the way it's been distributed and underwritten has not changed that much. Um, it's quite sad, um, but COVID has pushed in this area for insur insur insurance company to look at changes, to move faster with, um, with the demands. Before COVID, I would say that um, consumers were looking for more changes from these financial institutions, but um, they are uh, they have a much larger voice and power to stay put and not make changes to the ancient ways that they do things. Uh, we've since seen that change um, in the industry, at least for where I am from in Asia. Um, uh, Planner B, basically what we do is we consolidate uh, finance, finances into an app, and this includes a person's banking data, for example, um, their e-wallets, their banking transactions, and their insurance policies. Um, this is extremely important because for a lot of people, when they buy um, an insurance document, uh, insurance policy, they have no idea what they're buying in uh, in about 24 hours. Um, and if they try to buy something, they actually, um, you know, they, they go a lot on the trust from the salesperson. And this is, um, the, this is because financial literacy is quite low in the region. It's as low as 1% in Vietnam and 3% in, in Malaysia in comparison to 12% in UK and the US. Um, so distribution of um, such insurance products should be changed. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a bit. Um, the, the idea is that um, for underwriting to be done, someone has to, has to verify that the person insured is alive. And for the longest time, um, I mentioned to Armandi that the only way to verify is to be in, physically in one space. And um, video calls were really available for more than 10 years, but no one has actually um, decided to use that as a way of verification. Uh, Singapore has developed a national ID system called SingPass. And very recently, you could use your phone to verify through the app that you are alive and you are indeed that person. Um, but prior to this, the only way to verify is physically in the same spot in the same country. So across boundaries, um, purchase, um, even from one state to the other, it's not possible in, in the region. And this is very sad for places like Philippines, where transportation is a huge um, problem. It's a huge barrier. And um, it makes insurance and other financial products very inaccessible. 
So we're, we're here to change how things are being done, how um, policies are being distributed, um, how financial planning can be done to increase financial literacy, to ensure that it is a sustainable ecosystem for both um, the growing markets and the developed markets. Yeah, so um, that's that's all for me today uh, for this for this bit. I'll throw yeah. the mic back to Madi. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sherry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we'll we'll come back to that on uh, basically what's the path for sustainable growth in insurance sector, uh, ASEAN region, US, uh, all put together. Uh, yeah, and next we have Colin. Colin, what do you Thanks, think? Thanks, Amadeep. It's a yeah. pleasure to be with you tonight. And I know it's late in the morning in uh, Copenhagen, so I appreciate you moderating this in the middle of the night. Um, so I, I am the founder and CEO of Varo Bank. And Varo is uh, somewhat unique in the U.S. banking system in that uh, we're the first and only fintech uh, to become a fully licensed OCC national bank. And I think what what really makes us different is we are all digital. Um, we're very mission driven. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the broader societal problems that we're trying to solve. You know, we're FDIC insured, you know, we're a direct member of the Fed, part of the payments network system in the US. Um, and, and we're really using our data and technology to design a modern banking experience to help millions of consumers kind of move ahead in their financial lives. And you know, the first question I often get asked is, well, why do you have to be a bank? I and mean, Jagdu said, you know, oh, look, there's all these modern fintechs that can can sort of do their thing on the front end and you can do, have a commodity like bank on the back end. Well, I guess I was a practitioner in the banking system for 25 years before founding Borrow. And, um, you know, I guess... Varo was very much kind of a culmination of many years, but also the insight that the system has has largely been designed for for the haves and and the have nots are really very much left to their own resources, particularly in the U.S. where the economics are just not working for the banks. To, there's no economic incentive to serve what sadly is the majority of people in the United States right now that are sort of struggling to kind of get to the next paycheck. And so why be a bank? Because uh, at first, I think that it gives you a level of legitimacy and credibility that is hard to to have when, when you're kind of operating around the system. Um, it also also provides the economics to be able to put a lot more into your product value. And by that, you know, we're not sharing our economics with a bank partner. We've been able to develop a, a very modern technology stack from the ground up, which gives us, you know, and I, I started the company with a partnership with a sponsor bank. So probably know the economics of the before and after better than many. And the fact that I started in financial services, I know the, the economics of the before before. <laughs> and, and I would say we're operating at about 25% the cost of a traditional bank and half the cost of a fintech to be able to serve our customers. And so that just opens up this huge opportunity to um, to do more. Um, and then the other thing I've mentioned is um, our ability to innovate um, in, in very different ways, but very impactful ways that are more limited when you're beholden to a, a host bank or a sponsor bank, which, you know, we had a fantastic relationship with the bank core, which is our sponsor, but like there were only so many things we could do because they only have so much permission from the FDIC to allow them to white label certain things. And now with our bank charter, uh, we can offer everything that Bank of America can on the consumer side. I mean, we've got the same bank charter. And so, so our ability to really drive real innovation inside the system is, is pretty profound. And I think you're about to see that in the next year with Varo that we're going to start introducing products that uh, are, unfortunately, our fintech you know, colleagues out there just can, simply can't do. Um, you know, I'll give some examples like, you know, joint accounts and family accounts and joining the Zelle network and using our data from our transaction account customers to make, you know, much bigger lending decisions. Um, you know, and that data is not available to a typical fintech because the, their sponsor bank doesn't want to become a credit reporting agency. And so there's a, there's a whole series of things like that, that, um, you know, the bank charter really unleashes. And, and I've always been a believer that if you're going to drive real innovation and disruption, it's a lot better to do it inside the system. And, and so we will see. I mean, history will ultimately be the judge on that. But, uh, so, so a couple of things that I wanted to talk a little bit about is, you know, a 
just quickly on the process. So, so, you know, I think we did it. I believe we did it the right way. You know, obviously I'm biased because it was my choice, but, but, you know, it was really the hard way too. It took us three and a half years. We had to get approval from the OCC, the FDIC, the, um, the Federal Reserve. And so the U.S. banking system and the hurdles to get inside the regulatory system is probably the most uh, severe anywhere in the world. And, and so we kind of crossed that moat. Um, and I feel like we've, we really have built a, quite a moat for ourselves. Fortunately, we had great investors. Warburg Pincus, um, TPG, you know, Harbor Vest, some of the largest investors in the world that were backing us that would allow us to um, kind of cross that mode because it, it was a hundred million dollars of, of investment to, to kind of get there. And so you can't kind of do that. No offense, John, but on a VC, on an early stage VC check, you had to kind of, I had to go to the big boys and say, you know, I really want to do this. And will you have the patience to support me through the process? Um, and, and it's rigorous and you have to demonstrate that you can build a business that, you know, is going to operate safely and soundly in the banking system, you have to demonstrate to the but have really deep expertise and understand how to operate through different cycles and understand the various aspects of, of safely running a national bank. And so, so that, that was a little bit of kind of what went into it. And so, uh, but now that we're on the other side, um, you know, we've built a really exciting tech stack that, you know, on the front end, we have our client layers that we're using micro front end technology. We have an orchestration layer of uh, GraphQL that allows us to keep the, the, the front, front end uh, very light. We have microservices. We're using Google technology on the microservices. We're coding in Kotlin, which is a, which is a pretty advanced modern uh, technology. We use Kafka into our data lake. And so we've got, uh, we're working with AWS and SageWorks on the AI and ML. And so we've built a really modern agile I'll talk a little bit about are, are the customers that, that we serve. And as I mentioned, you know, this is just a massive group of people now in the U.S. that the you know, macroeconomics have not been kind uh, to to the majority of people who have seen everything from, you know, food and transportation and, and medical expenses and housing expenses and education expenses all going up while wages have been relatively stagnant. And so you've got a group of what I would say probably around 180 million people in this country that are kind of trying to just kind of make ends meet. They still want to try to get basic savings. They want to access credit, but these are, it's getting harder. And so banks like Borrow are focused on uh, several key aspects of trying to help improve people's financial well-being. So first and foremost is cash flow and giving them the tools to be able to, you know, the 101 of good financial health is you need to spend more than you earn, but that's sometimes easier said than done. And, but, you know, getting an early paycheck, eliminating hundreds of dollars of fees, we give uh, instant cash advances to help people bridge to the next paycheck. We give them access to gig work. So there's a lot of things that we're doing in our app to just sort of help people sort of manage and smooth out that cash flow and some other tools to help them there. The next is credit. You know, in the U.S., we have 45 million people who we who either don't have credit at all or they have very thin files. You have another very large group of people that have damaged their credit. And if you're living in America and you don't have credit or you have bad credit, everything is challenging, whether it's getting a phone or getting an apartment or getting a car, you know, or trying to someday have a home. And so we're providing tools to help people build credit, to help people start to access affordable credit. We just launched a product called Borrow Believe, which is a really innovative new product to help people without any upfront deposits, without any fees, start to build their credit rating. I mean, we've had just an overwhelming response to that just in the first uh, couple of weeks since we announced that. Um, you know, the other areas around financial resilience and then also providing access to some financial instruments that had had previously only been available to people who have a lot of wealth. And so we start with providing high yield savings and tools to help people save. And, and down the road, we'll be looking at, um, you know, Marianne, we should talk, you know, around how we provide sort of investment options and, and crypto and other things that that may not have been widely available to, to uh, mass market consumers. So I know I'm probably running over my time, but just wanted to give you a few um, 
the thoughts around what we're doing at Varro and you know we are, our our mission is to provide financial inclusion and opportunity to all all Americans and we're very excited around the traction that we're getting so thank you yeah uh, th- thanks colin uh, yeah that was that was pretty insightful and uh, <clears throat> including the uh, you covered bit of a regulatory landscape as well and uh, banking the unbanked uh, so so now all of us have actually taken turns and spoken so i like okay i, I will inside the conversation two directions like uh, let's go either technology wise or uh, regulatory wise a- any choices anyone okay so i'm going to go check because you know i think that um you can't just rip and replace stuff right in some of these large institutions so you know, Colin, while he's really challenged from a regulatory perspective, and, and mm-hmm. congratulations on surpassing all of those hurdles. I mean, when I started looking at money transmission, you know, three years ago, I was like, thank you, but thank you, let somebody else do it. So I applaud you for, for getting that done. But, you know, you did not have to rip and replace. You could use all of the newest technology where a lot of these really large institutions when they merge, you know, the, it's astronomical how much they've paid for each other. But behind the scenes, they pay even more to have that fabric where they have interoperability. Yeah. So that's where I think some of these challenges are for a lot of these stodgy institutions. Yeah, incumbents. It's a, it's a tough. I mean, I made the decision that um, a new build was a lot easier than a renovation. <laughs> and why I left that old world, because it's just it's like mind numbing. I mean, I, I, as as exhilarating and complicated as it is to build from scratch, it's easier than trying to um, try to rip out all that old plumbing and, and, and build a new business model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now, I was going to okay. say, when we look at, at companies, we, we only look for people who are going to build on a modern tech stack with the, the ability to pull in data from all over the place. And, um, no, I'm a big fan of what you're doing, Colin, at, at Varro. I've been following. Um, I will say everybody starts somewhere. So, so us early stage guys still we play a role before you get to the bigger to the bigger guys. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, uh, I believe uh, some of you would have seen uh, IMF's blog on. Um, this is a time for private currencies as well. I'm just posting the link. I think uh, we discussed about this. Any of you? have some thoughts on this or uh, are getting ready to prepare in this direction? We're keeping a close eye on it. I mean, I think that, you know, the whole kind of movement towards um, national uh, currencies is, is really interesting and it has all sorts of implications as well for the banking system, you know, in terms of, um, you know, will the fed be a direct issuer? Will banks issue the currencies? You know, it, would those currencies be considered part of funding? Um, you know, in terms of when you think about from a liquidity perspective, so it's, it opens up a lot of really interesting questions, but, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we do have to um, skate towards where the puck is headed <laughs> And, um, you know, I think it's just a matter of time and you're already seeing adoption around the world. Yeah. And you have to get it right, right? You don't have to get it fast. You have to get it right. So I think that in the U.S., um, it's going to be about five years. I mean, I speak with Daniel Gorfine and you know, he's working with Chris Giancarlo on the Digital Dollar Project. Um, Sherry, you are in an area that is way ahead of anybody else. I think the Monetary Authority of Singapore with their project Ubin is definitely the one to watch. But for us, we want to have both horizontal and vertical interoperability with all of these digital types of projects and central banks. And it's they're fascinating to watch the the how they're evolving. All right. I think it's interesting. Sorry, I'm mean, just one last thing. I think when we yeah. did, J- when I was at JP Morgan, we did the JPM coin quite early on, just to see the number of banks that joined that coalition, right, you know, from Canada and US and around the globe. And that's not backed by any regulatory authority, but just the fact that you're JP Morgan and you're now getting into a stable coin to do B two B, you start seeing traction, and that's in, you know exciting to see when that happens at a national regulatory bank level that will definitely get adoption. Um, and I think Denmark is another area where that's going to be pretty soon. Yeah. And Jagdeep, I think that you need both private and public sectors to work together on some of these projects. I don't think that this is going to come out of just one institution. I think we need a fabric of both private and public to work together on these projects. Yeah, completely agree. 
Yeah, uh, I do agree with you, Marianne, with uh, regards to the public and private sectors uh, working together. Um, and what we see, sadly, in Singapore um, is it's usually the public sector that has to make the first move before the incumbents would try moving. Even then, they are actually really dreading it. Um, we have a lot of problems trying to integrate with um, old companies. And and, the, and honestly, speaking to them, we understand that that's actually not in their interest at all. Um, and they... The, they have a lot of problems coming right down to data sets, to to prop, to um, integrations of systems that are all not speaking to each other. And we go around it. Um, we go around these problems that they have instead of trying to, like what Colin said, um, tear them down and, and building a new house altogether. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for for somebody to do it good, first somebody has to do it bad. We have seen that with the APIs in uh, open banking in in Europe. Okay, that uh, that comment is only for APIs, not for vaccines. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, technology side, I have some uh, one thing about like uh, like the payment space. Like, okay, uh, I live next to Sweden. We have RFID chips common, and people over trust their governments. So all all that is good. Uh, Jagdeep, that's a specific question to you. Like, do you see, are we heading in that direction with cashless societies and payments with chips? Or like, wh what's the next thing you see in the in this space happening next? I think chips are already here, right? I mean, we we saw chips all the way back in EMV when Europe was using it. Chips are here, and we're going to get to more cryptograms. And those cryptograms could now, we're like, the interface may change. They may be RF, they may be optical tomorrow, right? So Visa and MasterCard now have QR codes that are dynamically generated with cryptograms inside of it. Mm -hmm. So the interface is is not the issue. I think what's more interesting to me is like what is the what is the are we going from a centralized to a decentralized mechanism of creating and verifying these mm -hmm. and clearing settlements at a faster rate than what we're seeing today through and the pricing, obviously, right? Uh, that the networks have sort of held that pricing. And if we go into an open system, will that pricing become more easier for merchants to accept, especially in our space? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that when we see China host the Olympics in 2022, I think everybody's going to come back from that saying, wow, look at how everything is based on QR codes and how easy it is. Now, I'm not talking about how much the government sees on everybody's transactions, because yeah. credit card companies know exactly what you buy, right? And they have a lot of information on us. But I'm not saying that that's good or bad. I'm going to leave that for something else. But we're going to see how easy it is to use these types of systems on a world stage. Uh, yes. Just one <laughs> clarification, I'll add is credit card companies know where you buy and what you bought, but they don't know the SKU level data. They would yeah, love exactly. to get the SKU level data, right? And that's that's sort of the ultimate, which Google knows more because every time you buy something, the invoice comes with exact line item and the price to Google in your Gmail, but Visa and MasterCard never get any of it. So I feel like sometimes Google is in a better position because they buy the transaction data from Visa and MasterCard, they match it up with the email that comes with the invoice, and they know exactly what you bought there. And they ask you, how was your experience on your phone? And it's scary, like, how did you know that's the store I was in? Mm -hmm. But we're all okay with that, right? Um, so it's interesting how these pieces come together and how much Google and Apple know versus others. Yes, absolutely. Well, okay, we, we oh, are uh, actually short of time, and now I have to just take like a one one liner message from you. Where do you think we are headed next, one year from now? Uh, who goes first? Happy I to jump in. Yeah, I, mean, I think from my perspective, yeah. you know, I yeah. do think the 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 awakening has begun <laughs> in terms of the switch towards digital. I think COVID was a massive accelerant. I think yeah. over the next several years, you're going to start to see banks, the digitally native banks, emerging into the into the ranks of the top banks in the world. Thanks. Mariane, is it about yeah. DeFi? I, I'm just tempted to ask. Yes, there, I'm going to say that distributed ledger technology or blockchain yeah. is going to have mass institutional adoption in, in fintech and in financial institutions as well. Yeah, thanks. John, do we hear from uh, you? I'm going to say we're going to see more blended products across fintech lines. 
So I think what uh, what Colin's doing at Vara when you talk about taking different products that are available to certain segments and not to others and making those widely available, but I think it's bigger than, bigger than that because I think you're going to start seeing insurance, finance, asset management all under, you know, all nicely packaged. And so what Cherie's doing is actually close to where, where we're going when you put it all together in a nice wallet. Yeah. Yes. Cherie, the word is yours. I, I think over the next few years, we will see how um, digital distribution would um, exceed um, the, the rates now. Um, and that would include a new products being um, developed um, for these easier um, distribution, uh, perhaps with smart contracts as well, especially for um, um, new bank accounts, as well as insurance policies that are issued and, and claims experience will be better in that sense. Yes, thanks, Jerry. And Jagdeep, the last word is yours. <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll just say one thing. I think it will be interesting to see crypto come through on um, payment yeah. and checkout experience with Lightning. So the Lightning Network is getting more and more traction. So it'd be good to see that off-chain transaction happening in e-commerce. Uh, yeah, that that was that was wonderful again. Uh, all right, we are basically out of time, and uh, we are allowed to continue.